Namaste. Welcome to the Festival of Bharat. I am your host Kamal Madi Shetty, and today we have a very special guest with whom we are going to discuss the Indian economy as well as some of the most important developments in the last eight years in India. We have with us T V Mohandas Pai Ji. He is the current chairman of Arun Capital Partners and also a Padma Shri awardee and a very noted public intellectual. Namaste, Mohandas Ji. Welcome to the Festival of Bharat. Uh, Mohandas ji if i can begin by asking you about the recent piece of economic news that uh, made the headlines which is that india emerged as the fifth largest economy in the world in nominal terms how do you look at this milestone and what is the significance of this well i think it was expected to happen we all expected it to happen a couple of years back it happened late because of covid and other reasons and the fact that the rupee depreciated if the rupee was a stronger currency it would have happened many years back but it's happened and is inevitable very soon we'll vote take germany we'll vote take uh, japan in the next maybe 3 to 4 years and we'll be behind uh, the china so we'll have the us china and india uh, which is the way it has to be because china and india made up the largest part of the global gdp much before the industrial revolution for thousands of years and that's going to reappear again and the last 300 years will be a blimp in human history when europe overtook uh, asia and became successful because the industrial revolution now we are in the midst of the digital revolution and china and india are at the heart of it and we are going to be very large economies i think it's going to happen is inevitable but the psychologically it's a very very thing big thing for india remember we are colonized brutalized and looted by the british the british took away what people estimate to be 45 trillion dollars of today's wealth over the long road right uh, even the moguls even though sashi tharoor says the mogul looted but did not take out the money what sashi tharoor fails to add is that nadir shah came at thing in 1736 or so and looted the entire treasury of the moguls who had looted it for the rest of the country and took it away to iran if you go to the central bank of iran you can see all the treasures there even today so we are lost out in many years so i think psychologically is a very big blimp we are past the old colonial masters i hope lutians delhi who are the successors of the colonial masters who still have a colonial mindset will get over the shock of india vote taking great britain and understand that this is the country of the future and uh, they should start stop, stop abusing india so i think it's a great day absolutely sir and uh, you know india has made a lot of strides in the last few years and decades but uh, uh, unfortunately like you mentioned uh, a lot of times certain quarters they spare no effort to talk down uh, about india and but come on let me give some data come on set the context when we got independence in 1947 we were the largest most sophisticated economy in asia that because japan was destroyed in the war southeast asia was destroyed in the war china was the midst of the civil fight and the civil dispute right uh, internal strife so they were also not in good shape and we were the economy which had 1.5 billion pounds won by great britain for the war a very good army and a very good functioning industrial sector then after 1950 and just before that nehru brought in disastrous economic policies taking us on the path what he called socialism he didn't understand economics i think and he made india poorer and he suppressed indian capital nobody is against the public sector but he suppressed indian capital brought in license quota raj and uh, centralized economic decision making in delhi and made it very very uh, corrupt and subject to capture by people who capture the government and got what they want and get monopoly profits as a result India grew at 3.5 percent a year from 1950 to 1980. Population grew at 2.5 percent a year. Per capita income grew at only 1 percent a year for 30 years. The world grew the GDP at 4.5 percent a year. Asia grew at 6.5 percent a year. So by 1980, after 30 disastrous years of Nehru socialism and Indira Gandhi following suit, we were become a poorest country, almost the poorest country in Asia. Then we started opening up in the 90s. 90s we grew by 5.5 percent from 80 to 90 and their debt grew from 20 billion to 80 billion during the decade population grew by 2.25% per capita income grew by 3.25% uh, we became slightly better off uh, but you know it is a 91 we were broke we had 15 days of foreign exchange and we opened up and liberalized now look at the magic we were 275 billion dollars of gdp in 1991 march we have gone to 3.16 trillion dollars in 2022 march we have grown at 8.2% a year for 31 years for 31 years after liberalization 
and that is going to continue. So I think we'll be $5 trillion by 2026, maybe $10 trillion by 2032, two years later, provided the rupee doesn't depreciate too much. And we have got everything going for us in growth. So the disastrous policies of Nehru made us poorer, and we had to get over that. And that was uh, very bad. You know, China opened up in 1978, India opened up in 1991. Uh, we are China's economy in 2006. We are what China was in 2006. So if you grow now, we hopefully should be a much larger economy. And the challenge is going to be ourselves. Some uh, people who are uh, naysayers and, uh, and you know, malcontents will say, oh, you're a poor country. Yeah, of course, we're a poor country. Uh, per capita income is $2,500 at $2,200. That's not going to go away. But the collective strength of India is enormous. And if you say we have only $2,500, that is wrong because you must look at PPP. That currency can buy much more than equivalent amount of $2,500 in the US. Under PPP, we are $11 trillion. $11 trillion is nearly three and a half, four times uh, nominal GDP. We are the third largest economy in the world. We are in China, the United States, and then India, right? So I think we must understand this economic entire concept. So I think we're getting over the bad policies of Nehru. If we still have this Lutyens Delhi, which captured India and they feathered their own nest, they're all diminishing now and uh, India is growing up. So I think it's great news. Absolutely, Mohandas Ji. And I think that's a very comprehensive view of where we have come and to appreciate uh, the, the current milestones. I think it is important to take that comprehensive view. Uh, only then can we understand uh, the, the various challenges that we have faced as a nation. Uh, Mohandas ji, India has moved from a rent-seeking economy, which was very prevalent earlier, to a one uh, which is based on merit uh, and, and ideas and entrepreneurship. Now, this hasn't been an easy journey uh, like you uh, shared. Uh, but I wanted to ask you about what have been some of the most meaningful changes since uh, 2014 that the Modi government brought in uh, that enabled, uh, you know, some of these growth? Well, I think the Modi government did very important things for India. First of all, Modi tried to solve and solve substantially the major problem for India, that of poverty and deprivation. By this year end, most Indians will have a roof over the head, water in the tap, power in the switch, a toilet in the house, a stove in the house, a bank account, some money in the bank, a mobile phone connection, an internet connection, a medical insurance program uh, and health insurance, food on the table to the food program and education for the children and a road to the house. Now, once people go beyond survival, uh, they look at very different things and they're very different people. So he's solving the biggest problem that we had in the social sector. Second, he has solved the problem of infrastructure. Our national highway system is world class today in many parts of India. Our trains will be going at 45 kilometers an hour for goods traffic very soon from 25 kilometers an hour. Our ports, our airports are now grown beyond recognition. So internal logistic cost is coming down and becoming easier. Then he's brought in reforms in GST, 17 taxes into one tax. He's reduced corporate tax uh, to 25%. So corporate for profits are going up. Corporate tax collections have gone up. Compliance has gone up uh, tremendously. He's brought in changes in the law for foreign exchange to invest overseas easily. He has gone after black money, uh, black money people. He's brought in demonetization to put the fear into black money. And black money has substantially reduced uh, in the economy. And uh, he has made sure in the economic matters, a lot of activity has been taken to give more freedom to uh, people. And even the FDR regulations have been changed. Licensing has gone away for almost all industry. So you don't have to go to Delhi. So we are economically much freer today than 2014. And in the foreign affairs area, he has built bridges with everybody. The Middle East is now a friend. They're not a friend of Pakistan as much as India. Now the US is a deeper friend. We got association with Japan. And in the Ukraine conflict, he has demonstrated the independence of India's foreign policy, that India's national interest to dominate a foreign policy. We are not going to be anybody's poodle. Like we possibly were at one point of time of Russia, and then the United States, right? We're going to be independent. There's greater respect for India all over. And I think they've done a lot. And Modi also cleaned up the banking system, banking NPS are down, etc. So all the hard decisions that had to be taken to go to the next level of economic reforms have been done by Modi in the last eight years. And today, the economy is growing at a fast pace. Private sector investment is going up tremendously. We are seeing that corporate investment is also going up. We are seeing transportation costs come down. And we're seeing an improvement in the quality of life for many people 
but rural area, but urban areas have not benefited. Some of you know the Modi government has not spent enough on urban areas. There's a smart city program, but it's too small. It's too small and not of much impact. We need larger programs. We need financial autonomy for the larger towns so they can grow because urban areas are engines of growth, not villages. Urbanization creates concentration of human activity. Concentration of human activity creates specialization. Specialization improves productivity and thereby income. So we need urbanization to create more jobs. It's happening in India, but it's become very painful. We need urban reforms. So I think a lot of work has happened for Prime Minister Modi since 2014. Absolutely, uh, Mundas And again, that's a very comprehensive take of uh, the various uh, developments across various fields. Uh, but if I could talk to you about uh, the status of women in particular uh, since 2014 now girls education has been promoted like never before uh, and for the first times uh, since independent india uh, the birth rate of girls has actually exceeded that of boys and uh, at least in some parts of the country and uh, women today have better sanitation education and economic opportunities and they also have access to clean piped gas now uh, which was not the case earlier and which caused a lot of health problems uh, uh, and and many other things like you mentioned like better uh, roads uh, in villages water uh, how has uh, you know in your view the centrality of women changed uh, you know post 2014 look no country in the world has ever developed in history without empowering women women are 50 percent of population and they cannot be subjugated they cannot be put into a burqa or a hijab and kept at home right they're not childbearing machines they have to be treated as individuals and our constitution promises equality irrespective of gender. Sadly, that equality has not been put implemented because women in India don't have equal rights for the Muslim women. Hindu women have much more equal rights, maybe 80, 90 percent. They still need reform, but Muslim women don't even have the rights. So we need an Indian Women Right to Equality Act to make sure an Indian woman gets right. But here are the good news. We have 1,020 women per 1,000 men in India. So women outnumber men. Women live longer than men. I think women live some 71 years, men 67 years. Correct? And then that shows that, you know, don't suppress women. They're going to outlast you and have the last laugh. And they already do. There are more girls graduating from college than boys. It just two years ago that girls overtook in terms of the GER. There are more girls in school than boys. More girls coming into the public workforce. 50% of panchayat seats are reserved for women. More and more women are coming into the legislature. And corporate boards, 18% of the board members are women today. And even in the senior management, about 20% are women. 40% of the intake in the uh, you know, IT companies are women. So I think women are marching forward. And if you look at maternal mortality rate has come down, infant mortality rate on others has come down, uh, women malnutrition has come down, the age of women marrying has gone up, only a small percentage marry before the age of 18. There's been unbelievable social transformation. And this is accelerated since Modi came into power because what Prime Minister Modi did was to focus on women's emancipation and women empowerment by bringing in a lot of programs. You mentioned about the stove, you mentioned about the shelter, you mentioned about the toilets, and you mentioned about drinking water. All that has to reduce the burden of women because, you know, women take care of the house. We are a conservative country and the burden falls on the women. Now, I think that's all coming down and the women will be more productive players. What we need is to make sure that women who get educated get jobs, good jobs. North India is producing more women graduates, but jobs are less. All the jobs are in South India. So we need to create industry in North India so that more women can be employed and uh, that resource is not being used by this country. So there are still some challenges, but today we are much, much better than 2014. In 2014, we are much, much better than 2000. So there's been an improvement, but last eight years of Prime Minister Modi, there's been a steep jump in everything. Like you said, there are 938 and 958 girls born for 1,000 boys today, which has gone up from 918 or so, which I think is good news. Absolutely, uh, Mohandas ji. And I think uh, these are realities that need to be appreciated in order to uh, for us to actually face the challenges that lay ahead of us, uh, which actually brings me to the other question that I had. Uh, the Modi government, of course, has a remainder of term uh, for a few more years and uh, uh, in, in this current term. Uh, what would you like to see in terms of reforms agenda uh, where do you see that going and uh, what I think, uh, you know, in, into your mind should be the priorities in terms of uh, reforms, be it economically or also even on the social side? Look, let me explain to you the context. Any national government has to do five things. One, protect 
the external boundaries of the country. Modi has done it very well. Second, protect the life, liberty, and property of citizens in this country. That means the police force. That's not been a good job. We are no better off with the police today than we were when Modi came. There's not been enough police reforms. Yes, the concurrent subject. He has to work with the state government, but not much action has happened. Right. Third, justice has to be delivered. The Indian justice system has failed. The biggest failure of our 75 years of freedom has been the failure of the justice system to deliver justice to people. If you have to wait 15, 20 years to get justice in a small case, what do you do? There are cases of a constitutional nature pending in the Supreme Court for 20, 25 years. Cases are not heard even for rent control, for small crimes, etc. There's 250,000 under trials in prison, poor people who have spent more than 50% of the time they would have been sentenced to if they had been charged, if they had been convicted for the crime. What do you do with these poor people? Supreme Court has said if they spend 50% of the time, they must be released. They're not being released. Today, if you are rich and you have the right uh, uh, connection with the right lawyers, you can go to Supreme Court and get an immediate relief, like happened for Tista Setulwa. Like the SD said, what happens to all the women who don't have access to a lawyer and can't afford to pay a lawyer? I mean, are they to be denied uh, justice? The Supreme Court should have passed an order that anybody who goes before the high court for a bail should get a bail within 72 hours. That should be in the order, so everybody benefits. But the Supreme Court gave a conditional bail or interim bail and put it back. What about all the people? So the justice system has failed. There has to be justice reform. Justice reform means that the capacity of the lower judiciary has to be enhanced. Capacity of high courts have to be enhanced. The appointments have to be made much quicker. The technology has to be brought in the justice system. Much more investment has to be done. That is holding India back, right? So I think justice system has failed. Then foreign foreign affairs. Modi has done very well in foreign affairs. The last one is uh, about uh, the currency, and the currency is has been handled very well. So what are the what are the things that Modi government has not done? I would not call it failures. Tax terrorism. Tax terrorism still continues. You know, Jaitley promised end to tax terrorism in 2014. The promise has not been kept. There were four and a half lakh crores of tax disputes that time. Now it's gone to 12 lakh crores. Still, perverse assessments are made. A lot of things are made. A lot of things have happened. Refunds are coming faster. It's become electronic. And there's faith assessment. But not enough. What about the old disputes? The disputes have to be settled. More cases are cluttered up. More uh, perverse assessments are being done. And the rent seeking in the tax department has not come down. GST has been reformed. India tax has been reformed. There's been great reform, not in direct taxes. And the tax rates are too high for honest people. Dishonest people get away. There's another big failure which has to be uh, remedied. And the third thing is urban governance. Urban governance sucks. You're seeing how Bombay has deteriorated, Bangalore has deteriorated. Which city will you say has a good quality of life in India? Not any city. In the last 15, 20 years, in all cities, the quality of life has only come down because lack of infrastructure, lack of local governance, lack of resources, etc. I think these are the three big things that have to be done in the next one to three years of the Modi regime. Because these are very important issues which determine the future of this country. The justice system, you know, eliminating tax terrorism, reducing all the disputes because they are a burden, big burden to everybody and creates fear. And then making sure that uh, urban governance is improved. Absolutely, Mohandas Ji. And I think all of these are going to be so important as we look at the next leap of growth for the Indian economy and Indian society in general. Um, which, uh, and I wanted to ask you, uh, you know, what, how do you see the envision or how do you envision uh, Bharat's future in the next 25 years? Uh, now, Prime Minister Modi has called it the Amrit Kal. Uh, and that has actually prompted a lot of commentary about what our priorities should be. Uh, you've ob obviously laid down many of the things that need to be done uh, in the very immediate uh, future. Uh, but in, in terms of economic size or in terms of India's influence on the world, what kind of a Bharat do you envision, uh, you know, emerging in the next 25 years? At the broad level, I envisage a Bharat where everybody will have the necessities of life. There'll be no deprivation. There'll be no poverty. That's a big ticket item. Second, a Bharat where every child can dream big, will get the education of high quality a child requires and adequate employment and economic opportunities. A Bharat which is spiritual, a Bharat which preserves his great civil science, civilization heritage, and a Bharat which is a heaven for the freedom of the mind, where there can be open debate, there can be discussion, and there is no dogma. And a Bharat which is economically strong, which has a trade surplus, which is a major exporter, 
and which has creating large number of jobs for young people and a bharat which is respected throughout the world for his economic strength for his political stability for his civilizational strength and for the high intelligent and capability of his people who will be all over the world and work to show what indians are so a bharat which is looked up with respect and now by the whole world and which is not seen as a poverty stricken colonized country anymore absolutely amon das ji i think uh, that's a beautiful vision for our country uh, and our civilization uh, and finally as uh, you are a mentor to so many young people uh, in india and uh, through our platform uh, i wanted to request you to give a message to the youth of bharat today look my message to everybody is dream big work hard to achieve your dream the opportunities are unlimited the opportunities are global be true to yourself be true to dharma always keep the tenets of dharma because it's only dharma that will make you a good citizen that allow you to discharge your duties that allow you to make cities better that will solve the dilemmas that you face in life and bring in rama rajya into india and the world absolutely absolutely mohandas ji thank you so much i think that's thank a wonderful you. note to conclude this conversation uh, about bharat uh, its future its present uh, and the various other aspects that we discussed today thank you so much for sharing you. your insights with us thank you uh, to our viewers please do subscribe to our channel if you uh, haven't already and do subscribe to both our channels on chitti media as well as the festival of bharat we'll be posting content on both of them we'll see you again in another such inspiring conversation uh, to let us know what you think about this uh, in the comment section we'll see you again namaste 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 we hope you enjoyed this chitti media content please remember to subscribe to us and switch on the notifications for this channel for our other social media links more content and to support our work please visit cittti.net dhanyawad namaskar